Laura Murray is a professor of cultural studies and English at Queen's University. Past research of, of hers has included work on the history of newspapers and newspaper readership in the 19th century and ethnographic study of visual arts in Kingston. She's the co-author with Tina Piper and Christy Robertson of Putting Intellectual Property into Its Place, um, as well as other publications. Lisa Petersma is a master's student in the Cultural Studies program at Queen's. She has studied literature and studio arts at Concordia and is interested in material culture, memory studies, and narrative. Her current research deals broadly with memory and farming. Well, <laughs> that's fascinating. And the intersection of these with land use and landscape. Today, they'll be speaking on a valuable book to me, The Scrapbooks of Mimi McColeman as Archive and Labor. Uh, I would just want to first say thank you, a quick thank you to Laura um, uh, for her comments and feedback on various drafts of this paper and for uh, agreeing to run the slides <laughs> with me as well as inviting me to work with her on this project. Minnie McCollman made at least 23 scrapbooks over 30 years. The scrapbooks, when closed, are surprisingly light, but the pages, which are sometimes quite thick, and in most cases covered edge to edge with layers of clippings and annotations, exude the solidity of lived time. Their spines and page edges are brittle, and as we study the book, small pieces of paper would break off and collect on the work table, the chaff of reopening and rereading. Signs of Minnie's creative bookbinding are everywhere, with pages nearly undulant at times, under the weight of clippings fastened by shrunken liquid adhesive or pieces of scotch tape. This layered materiality combines with countless annotations, asterisks, underlines, sidebars, and marginalia, often written first in one hand, then retraced with what seems a much older and less steady hand, to accrete a thickness of self that is both material and temporal. Material in the use of everyday items like medical tape, string, and butcher's paper, and in the many places where the book's pages have been mended, reinforced, and altered, Temporal because the layering of annotations tells us that the books were made, read, and reread at different times throughout Minnie's life. Reading her books then becomes a journey across time, one often brought into the present with surprising force and feeling. And yet to call it reading is to reduce the experience into a too widely understood sense of the text made intelligible. Given Minnie's abiding fascination with puzzles, I have taken my, portrait, my point of departure as that wider range of meanings noted for the word riddle in Old English. The meanings of consideration, debate, imagination, and example, which are indeed cross-referenced under riddle and point to a now obsolete meaning of read, to guess, make out, or tell by conjecture. This seems closer to the mark especially since reading in its standard sense often relies on the logic of page order, of meaning being revealed through turning one page after another, a logic that was not necessarily there for Minnie when she consulted and created her books. The material does not obey a, co a conventional beginning, middle, and end construction, and there is evidence to that the size of the clipping had more to do with where it ended up on the page than subject matter, although hidden meanings are sometimes activated by placement alone. It seems plausible that the books were worked up from the front and back covers towards the middle, a hypothesis that transforms the middle blank pages in a number of the books from omissions to ciphers, unfilled round centers around which the rest of the book was formed. Intentional or not, the blank pages of the overside of worked pages, little more than patchworks of adhesive and tape stains, serve as powerful reminders of unfinished projects, things lost or uncollected, letters unwritten, words left unsaid. Despite these silences, there are many more places where the material rings truest when spoken aloud. Minnie wrote and collected countless expressions of wit and wisdom that she worked into her books, recording most between double quotation marks. 
where an author is indicated, these marks seem the standard indication that the inscription is verbatim. But the sheer number of unattributed or modified expressions in double quotes seems rather a cue to the elocutionist. These are sayings to be said aloud and relished. To take just two examples, learn to say no, it is more useful than Latin. <laughs> Rarest social grace I know, say goodbye, get up and go. In addition to the quotations and sayings many collected, the connection between elocution and verse was maintained and reactivated in other ways. I traced one of Minnie's multiply collected, though never dated or sourced poems, Guilty or Not Guilty, to a microfilm of the February 11th, 1948 issue of the Family Herald. As with three or four of the other places in Minnie's books where this poem is collected, the clipping has been annotated to indicate its unique place in her memory. The annotation varies slightly from clipping to clipping, but always indicates that it was a verse recited in school. What I wish to highlight from this annotation is Minnie's bracketing of her own initials. The doubly stated speaker seems to suggest an awareness of readership beyond the private sphere. Clipping the poem in two to make it easier to read is one thing, but if the books were solely for her own use and enjoyment, why bother specifying that me means Minnie McCollman? To take one other example in support of this interpretation, there are a number of clippings collected in various books which tell the story of the willow pattern plate, or the willow pattern rather, commonly used on crockery. In one case, Minnie cut and pasted an alternate story and wrote in pencil at the bottom, one version, I prefer the other. Here too, the offering of a reading she did not favor would seem to invite outside readers. Of the dozen printed examples of Minnie's own writing collected in these books, only four directly identify her as the author, while two others note her initials for a grand total of six authored pieces of writing. The remaining works appear under various pseudonyms. A lover or observer of nature, country scribe or simply reader. It is not always clear when and where these pieces appeared, but most were likely printed in the local Stainer Sun. On one occasion, a poem was printed in the Family Herald. What publication, date, and authorship information we have comes from Minnie's annotations, since she clipped and kept copies, sometimes multiple copies, of her verse as and when it was printed. From these notes, insofar as printed work is a judge of production, she was actively writing and rewriting between the ages of 43 and 83. As her chosen pseudonym suggests, the subjects of Minnie's works were often told from the vantage of witness and reflect a natural world in her own or others, real or imagined interactions with it. There are two pieces of verse that I, wa I wish to discuss in some detail. The leaf mouse and the giant's name. Through these two works, it is possible more of the riddle that is Minnie McCollman can be read, that is, guessed, made out, or told by conjecture. The leaf mouse is a seven stanza poem that appears twice in the books, once in a version published in 1949, and again is published in 1962. Of interest here is how the poem was reworked in the 13 years between printings. Both versions tell the same story, spotting a dried leaf being blown by the wind and mistaking its form for a scurrying mouse. But the grammar is fudged in the first stanza of the second printing, and the imagined object, the mouse, appears throughout the poem between double quotation marks. The second printing from 1962 begins, one autumn day from my window, I seen, oh, what did I see? Well, I declare it was a mouse, a mouse that grew on a tree. Though not entirely rewritten from the 1949 printing, there's an immediate liveliness and energy to this later version. The break of the first line at window, the colloquial scene, and the midline full stop introduced by the exclamation point all demonstrate a more experienced writer and ear. Little surprise then that the leaf mouse first appeared under the observer of nature pseudonym, while the later reworked and in my view stronger poem appeared under Mrs. Minnie McCollman. Of the countless riddles Minnie collected, many are charades. That is, the kind of riddle in which each syllable or, or a word, or a complete word or phrase, is enigmatically described. To cite just one example she clipped, I am neither fish, flesh, nor fowl, yet I frequently stand upon one leg. And if you behold me, I stand upon two. What is more strange, if you again decapitate me, I stand upon four. The answer is glass, lass, and ass. You might have to repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> 
if you remove the G. <laughs> but the vast majority are more playful than enigmatic. Their solution's a mix of innuendo and wordplay. Aside from this example, there's also... <laughs> Uh, there's also, what seven letters did the old woman say when she looked into the empty flour barrel? O-I-C-U-R-M-T. <laughs> Minnie's riddling, reading, and writing collided in her poem, The Giant's Name, which was printed in the Family Herald in response to a riddle poem submitted by James F. Sutton of Emo, Ontario, a small town about 1,600 kilometers northwest of Stainer. Sutton's poem, which Minnie clipped and pasted beside her own, describes a giant over 12 feet tall who wants to visit Emo Fair and started from a tiny thing. Like Robin Hood, the giant is brave and bold and wears a band of gold. The 32-line verse concludes by asking readers to name Sutton's giant. Minnie's reply is as follows. My name is Minnie McCollman, sure, but I have no giant at my door. I thought I might come and proclaim James F. Sutton's giant's name. He was a noble fellow, sure, so strong and handsome to endure. The winds that around about him did blow, but, I, but he kept his head till his time to go. I hope at Emo Fair he got first prize, and that next year many more may rise, a monument to the wise full head of that grand sunflower so long since dead. There is something heartbreaking about this poem. Perhaps it's just too obvious. Keep your head until your time to go. The ever faithful subject, longing for eternal life. This sort of message appears many times in many scrapbooks. But as the answer to a riddle, the poem operates on a number of different levels. As a literary form, the riddle has been with us since at least the, se the seventh century and is arguably the earliest form of secular poetry in English. The riddle poem to which Minnie's verse responds can be seen as a distant relation to that long tradition first collected in the 10th century volume, The Exeter Book, a manuscript believed to have been copied from earlier collections and which famously preserves over 90 different Anglo-Saxon riddles. Scholars of Old English and The Exeter Book, notably Patrick J. Murphy and Daniel Tiffany, have long noted that in many of The Exeter Riddles, the, middle, the mystery or riddle creature directly addresses the reader, ending with the phrase, say what I am called, or say who I am. The general conceit of these riddles is to simultaneously, as Murphy has written, quote, animate and obscure some inanimate facet of material reality, end quote. Here the two poems modify this tradition in that the speakers of both declare their identity right at the beginning, whereas the subject of the riddle is referred to in the third person. Can you tell me my giant's name, asks Sutton. Minnie's reply notably capitalizes the first letter of the giant's name, effectively infusing the flower with personhood as capital S, sunflower. No doubt this is in part a signal that the answer or sunflower has been found, just as the reference Minnie makes to Sutton's giant's name serves to cue family herald readers that the poem is a response. There are a number of points here that move us both further from and closer to a portrait of Minnie. First, the reader of the scrapbook poem is confronted by an immediate and resident contradiction between the lines of Minnie's reply, declaring the sunflower long since dead, and the, con the continued existence, both poem and sunflower, as carefully clipped and preserved, though originally ephemeral objects. In context of our attempt to riddle Minnie from her scrapbooks and her writing, the poem's opening, my name is Minnie McCollman Shore, fairly shouts her authorship with a directness unlike any of her other writing. Balanced against this strong declaration of her identity, however, is the material of context, since Minnie has clipped the original riddle to which her poem is a response. And through it, we see that her line is written in imitation of the first. My, James, my name is James F. Sutton, sure. But this clipping, the riddle poem preserved beside her own, is also the very thing, the original prompt, and now the contextual clipping, that initiated and continues to animate the giant's name. Finally, unlike the Exeter riddles, which speak in a way that simultaneously illuminates and obscures the object of the riddle, the uniform of Lincoln Green that cloaks Mr. Sutton's flower on its way to Emo Fair 
is a rather thin disguise that lacks the, quote, high degree of artifice and formal sophistication or dark speech that Tiffany has noted in its genre forebearers. Yet for all its simplicity, the giant's name seems both a far richer and less familiar monument to that wise full head than a mere riddle solution. As one clipping set of thousands rather, set in the deeply annotated and evidently much loved context of Minnie McCollman's scrapbooks as a whole, like its author, it both resists and invites self-disclosure. Earlier I suggested that Minnie's use of double quotation marks around the many anonymous quotes seemed to invite the reader to speak the verse aloud. As part of her abiding interest in puzzles, quizzes, and like, Minnie also handwrote long lists of questions and answers, perhaps as an aide memoir. Where these handwritten quiz and answer keys appear, the question and answer are sometimes bound together as a fast fact with the whole enclosed in round brackets. There's a few examples there, but a couple to pick out. A mill is one-tenth of a cent, and any Oakley is a free ticket or pass. Port side of boat is left. Though parentheses commonly indicate a subordinate clause or an aside of secondary importance to the main phrase, here they contain both question and answer, the thing and its definition, together as a whole. The title of this talk is taken from the only cover of mini, mini scrapbooks that was annotated in any significant way. On the upper right hand fore edge of one of the covers, Minnie wrote, a valuable book to me. The bracketed and self-enclosed me, placed as it is beside her assertion of the book's value, qualifies the strength of that value claim and may sound or be humble. But it may also be taken to contain a certain declarative power to me, MMC, a frankness, a frankness that suggests take it or leave it, and an ambiguity that neatly encapsulates what Anne Fadiman has called the fugitive quarry that is the nature of reading at work in these books. So um, I'm just going to offer a little postscript to, uh, to, to Lisa's talk. And um, so Minnie McComan was my great grandmother. And um, that's how, in case you're wondering, we, where, where, how we have these books. And um, so uh, this, this is a, a picture. She's standing on the right, um, looking kind of boyish. And next to her is her daughter, Violet. And in front of is her, her is her mother. And in her mother's arms is my mother, who's, who's actually right up there also. She's grown. <laughs> And um, that's my mother again. Um, so you may have noticed when we were flipping through some of those pages that there, there are snapshots, photographs here and there, um, juxtaposing family life with other more glamorous worlds and so on. Um, so it was really a pleasure to have Lisa work with me last summer on these books, which my mother has uh, looked after for so long. And we had never really ha taken the opportunity to just spend a lot of time with them, go through every page, just try and make sense of the voluminous stuff that lies therein. And um, I think besides um, Lisa's uh, acuity with the material, one thing I really appreciated was that I was a bit self-conscious about this being some sort of a vanity project. So it was nice to have somebody else who really got fascinated with them. Um, and um, we decided today to present um, her work on the scrapbooks before telling you anything about the biographical Minnie McCollman. Um, which I think was a performative uh, kind of reflection or experiment on the problems and desires uh, that we may have. And in fact, Peter LaRocque talked about in the first talk of the first session yesterday um, of, of wanting to read uh, an object um, through the life that produced it. And um, so you can tell us later whether this was illuminating or frustrating for you. Um, but we, we decided to leave the biographical uh, to the end. And Lisa really approached Minnie as a riddle, and I did too. I didn't know Minnie. I was just tiny when she died. Um, but um, I myself um, tend to want to resist the impulse to, to read through the books to the person. And I, I tend, given my um, research um, practice uh, in the past, to look at them in terms of media history, um, in terms of um, uh, 
a general feminist history of women's work and, and place in the world. Um, and in other contexts, I've worked on the question of how women engage with mainstream in media. I've worked a lot with women readers of 19th century American newspapers. So the scrapbook is a, can be a document of, of uh, how women are, are reading um, material that wasn't necessarily written for them, although this is, this is a little bit different. Um, so my own essay on the scrapbooks focuses on just one poem that appears in them, and it's not one of Minnie's. It's by some New York bon vivant. Um, and how that poem has circulated um, more broadly beyond the scrapbooks. So um, uh, just thinking about all the very interesting talks that I've heard so far in this conference um, about what a self-portrait might be, um, it, 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 uh, it seems striking to me that Minnie could have produced uh, something that was much more directly a self-portrait, but instead focused on other people's voices and other people's faces uh, throughout her books. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about who she was. This is when she was young. Um, she was born in 1880 in Gray County, Ontario, uh, in the Blue Mountains. And she descended on both sides from County Monaghan, Ireland, through her father, John, who was a farmer. Uh, she married Frank McCollman, who was also a farmer and the son of a Methodist preacher. They had two children, Duncan and Violet. Duncan was a plumber and stainer, and Violet was a teacher. In 1936, both of her children married, and in 1939, her husband died. She lived for 30 more years, though, and this is when she made the scrapbooks. Um, she made over 20 of them, and she kept repairing them and changing them and adding to them. And uh, in fact, I don't know, my mother seems to keep finding more of them. So <laughs> we're not sure there how many there are. And besides the notebooks, there are also um, Besides the scrapbooks, there are also notebooks made out of butcher paper that have been attached together with string. And they mainly contain notes on things she heard on the radio. So that's another part of her kind of media environment. So um, I guess, you know, just not to, not to, oh, I have to show you the last picture because it's the most beautiful one. Um, has it been agreed on whether my mother or my father took this photograph? Um, I was actually in the picture, but I was cropped out. <laughs> well, there you go about the materiality of photographs. Um, so, so there, there's, there's many um, studying photographs. You see, so it, it ties in nicely with your talk. And uh, you know, I don't, I don't really know, for example, what she would think of the fact that we currently store these scrapbooks in a Smirnoff box. Well, in fact, I do know what she would think of it. She would be perhaps quite appalled. But I think, uh, I think she would probably be pleased that they have educated and amused others besides herself. And, and I don't think that she would be upset that people take different things from them. So I'll just end with a quote uh, that she has in her scrapbook. A book, though mainly as the writer makes it, is also largely as the reader takes it. <laughs>